All right. So welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today I have Steve McChesney. Did I say your last name right? Like a pro. Most people get it wrong the first time, but you did just fine. Awesome. <laughs> he is a sales and marketing business trainer and coach. And he is an international best-selling author. And today we're going to have a nice conversation with him about his journey. So welcome to the podcast, Steve. Thank you so much, Keisha. It's so good to be here. Awesome. All right. So you have a lot of different jobs when you're growing up, right? Um, did you ever dream of doing one specific thing, right? And not like Superman or something. <laughs> you, you know, it's interesting because yes, the answer is yes. On every job that I've had, well, not every job, but most every job that I've had, I was like, this is the job that yeah. I want. Um, but then it didn't last for a lot of reasons. We'll get into some of that, but, but they've all been good. Boy, there's nothing, nothing was wrong or, or bad because they all led to where, what I do today. So, you know, it's, it's, I'm a firm believer that everything you do in life happens for a reason. And that reason is good because it, it, it isn't so much like you're destined for anything, but in a way you are, you, it leads you to your destiny of where you're supposed to be. You know, we have grand plans of where we'd like to be, mm -hmm. but the universe has another plan for us and we end up where we're supposed to be. And I feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be now, but I had a lot of fun along the way because some of those jobs were a lot of fun. <laughs> I know I got questions for you, but so yeah. what was the one thing that as a kid you were like, I want I think I'm going to want to do this when I grow up. Um, I wanted to be an actor. Oh, okay. I, I grew up in, in Los Angeles in, in Hollywood. So mm -hmm. I was surrounded by the entertainment industry, the business, and I was always intrigued by it. Um, I, I, well, I, I was my mother, uh, I was raised by a single parent mm -hmm. and she had a drinking problem. Mm -hmm. So there were some issues with that. You know, we lived in a very poor area of Hollywood. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of supervision. I don't want to sell my mother short because not at all. She did definitely the best she could with what she had at the time. And it was great. I mean, she had love and that was the most important thing that I did get in spades. But, um, but I was kind of on my own. So as far as after school, I wouldn't go home. You know, I had a babysitter that was there sometimes. Um, so I got to walk the streets a lot. So I, I went to Santa Monica Elementary School in Hollywood. Uh, that's right across the street was the Hollywood Cemetery. And right behind the Hollywood Cemetery was the back wall of Paramount Studios. So when I'd get out of school at Santa Monica Elementary School, I would sneak into the studios. And in the beginning, when I first started sneaking in, like security and stuff didn't really approach me because they thought I was somebody's kid, you know, <laughs> on the set. And I, I'd go right into the sound stages and I'd watch them film. I actually became a regular watching like Gomer Pyle and Dick Van Dyke and uh, the Bonanza show, you know. And in fact, on Bonanza, they, I, they were all calling me little Stevie because I was always there. And, you know, everybody thought I was somebody else's kid. <laughs> <laughs> But then it got to the point, I mean, I'm telling you, I did this for months and it got to the point where pretty soon they knew that I wasn't, I didn't belong to anybody. And they did check on me and they found out who my mother was and they talked to my mother, uh, the studio security people did and told her what I was doing. And, and they, she said that she'd make sure I didn't do it anymore, but I'd still do it. And then they kind of knew, they kind of knew my mom had this bar she hung out in that, that, and that's what it was like anyway. Not good, not bad, just it was. Right. But I had a blast because I was watching them film and I learned so much about the film process and I always wanted to be an actor. Um, I remember we lived in this house, this apartment, not a house, it's an apartment. And down the hall, there was this guy who was trying to become an actor. I don't think he ever made it. You know, I was so young, maybe he did. And I just don't remember his name. But I remember he'd get scripts. And I remember I'd help him with his scripts because he was trying to memorize them. So that was always my aspiration. I wanted to be an actor. Um, I remember there was a kid in, when I got older in junior high school, there was a kid that was doing a lot of commercials and I thought, man, that's great. He is famous. You know, yeah. you know, he, he did an Oscar Mayer, uh, baloney commercial. And it's like, wow, everybody knows who this kid is. And then I remember looking at him and he always had dirt behind his ears. And I thought, 
he needs to wash his face better. <laughs> so everybody's real. <laughs> right. Everybody's real. So that was my that was my desire. And and um and then it came to pass. It didn't come to pass as me being an actor, but I did become a stuntman. Mm -hmm. And um when I was, uh, I got out of high school, I went straight into the army. I, I went to the army and I spent a few years in the army. It was right at the end of the Vietnam War. And when I got out of the army, I moved back to Los Angeles and I went to film school and I wanted to pursue that career in film. Um, but I had to also become a waiter because the government paid for my rent. They paid for, you know, to, I mean, not, not my rent. They paid for my tuition. I had to pay for my own rent. I had to pay for my own food. So I got a job as a waiter and I hated it. Um, I, I appreciate waiters so much. I tip them immensely because it's such a hard job. There's nothing worse than grumpy, hungry people. So I hated the job. A guy in film school, he was a stuntman. And he said, well, you know, I know this guy who teaches how to do stunt work and he's really good. He's Charles Bronson's stunt double, you know? And he goes, I can hook you up. And I said, yeah, please, that's in the field. And I was a gymnast all through high school. You know, I was into martial arts. So I was into that anyway. Um, so I went to stunt school and my stunt teacher's name was Kim Kahana. And one of the things that Kim taught us was how to sneak into studios. And I thought, I got that in spades, man. I've been doing that since I was a kid. <laughs> I know how to do that. So I ended up sneaking into Universal Studios and they were filming at the time Battlestar Galactica. And one of the stars of that was Lauren Green, who was from Bonanza. Mm -hmm. And so I snuck into the studio, snuck into the sound stage, and I saw Lauren Green sitting on his chair and I started walking straight toward him. Well, the production assistant stopped me and he goes, can I help you? And I'm like, oh, I'm a friend of Mr. Green's. And he goes, uh, okay, is he expecting you? And I went, oh, no, no, I'm surprising him. He goes, no, 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 we don't do that here. And I'm saying, look, I'm an old friend of his. And Lauren Green's looking over it, and I'm flaring my arms, and I'm talking, and I'm pointing at him. And he finally just goes and waves us over. And so we, the production assistant is not happy with me. We walk up to him, and I say, Mr. Green, you, you probably don't remember me, but when I was a kid, I used to come to the Bonanza set. And he looked at me, and he went, Stevie? And I went, yes! Oh, my gosh. By the way, this is the first uh presentation that i'm going to tell you about how everything you do in life leads to something else that you don't even realize when you're doing it so i said yes and he goes what are you doing and i said well I, you know i was in the army and now I'm, I'm trying to break into stunt work and i'm going to stunt school kim kahana is my teacher and he goes have you got your sag card and uh, for those you know if you don't know that is a screen actors guild that's the union you have to join to in hollywood to actually get the real money. Um, and I said, no, and I'm, I'm, I'm still working at that. And he goes, wait a minute. He calls over the director and tells the director to give me a job doing some kind of a stunt so I can get my SAG card. Wow. So getting your, how, what is the process for getting a SAG card? Well, in, it's different depending on where you live. Mm -hmm. California is a, uh, a closed, it's called a union state. It's a closed state. They can't hire a non-union person without paying a, a hefty, penalty. There's a, there's a fine for that. That's why producers don't just hire anybody. They have to go to the union to hire. So it's called the Taft-Hartley Act if they hire somebody that's not in the union. And the only way they can get away from that is if they have to have something right now and they can't find somebody in the union right now that can do it. Then they can get somebody that's not in the union, put them in the position, but then that person has to join the union. So that's how it works. So at the time, the way that the, the Battlestar Galactica people got away with it is because they had to have somebody that could take a punch, not a real punch, but that's what they said. We needed somebody, a stuntman. We didn't have a stuntman on set and this guy was there. And so we had to, you know, we needed him right now for production costs. Um, so that was the, ta they tapped Hartley me into the union. Then of course I paid my, my dues and then I became a union member. Um, I ended up actually doing over 350 TV shows and movies. Um, I used to work a lot on Starsky and Hutch and Wonder Woman and Battlestar Galactica. I love Wonder Woman. Oh, it was great, man. <laughs> you know, and for me, it was my dream come true. I was on a Hollywood set all the time and I'd made it basically. I'd made it in Hollywood. Um, and then I got hurt. And mm -hmm. so that kind of ended the stunt career. Didn't need to, didn't need to because all of my stunt buddies, every one of them have broken every bone in their body. They're wired together. That's the occupation. And, but for me, I went through, I crushed my left kneecap and it was a pain I never wanted to go through again. So I, I 
decided to get out of the stunt work. Now, everybody said I was crazy. They said, man, everybody works so hard to get to where you are. And you're just going to throw it away. And I'm like, I'm not throwing it away, but I'm not going to do this part anymore. And uh, I ended up becoming a talent manager okay, after that. Stop right there. Stop right there. Yep. Because you're messing up my questions. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. So um, as we know, Steve has done a lot of different, you know, careers and we're going to talk a little bit about them, but I want to do it differently. So okay. I'm going to read some of Steve's job titles uh -huh. and of these jobs. Tell me how long, what you loved and what you hated and what you learned. Okay. Love, hated, learned. Right. And how yep. long you did it for. So the first okay. one is restaurant owner well let me let me not start with that one let me start with talent manager because that's what you were going into okay so talent manager how long did you do that i did it for 18 years wow yep what did you love about it uh i got to travel the world a few times um because i had celebrity clients and um I got to experience things. I was in Moscow in 1993 when they tried to do the overthrow of the government. Um, had to be protected, you know, because of what was going on there. We were filming a movie. Mm -hmm. um, I got to ride on the German Autobahn. We were doing 145 miles an hour and we got passed by a motorcycle. And the driver looked at me and said, he never would have passed me if I had my summer tires on. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> So just being able to see the different cultures in the world and, and to um, experience and, and, and see not only the differences amongst people, but also the similarities that we all share. It was, it was very eye-opening, and I really loved that part of that job. What did you hate? I hated having to negotiate the money mm. because then I got to see the worst of people. I mean, it's... You know, there's a reason that actors have managers, you know, business wise, the business side of things, they don't want to deal with the talent because they don't want to offend them by offering them a little bit of money, you know, but they can easily do that with the representatives. Now, as a manager in Hollywood, legally, I'm not supposed to be able to negotiate the money. That's an agent's job. Mm -hmm. Agents are licensed. And but the way it really works is the agent comes to the manager and says, this is what they're offering. And then the manager says that either works or that doesn't work, or we need some other stipulation here. And then the agent goes back to the, the studio and then they actually ink the deal. So, but having to do the negotiation. And I also hated that I didn't know what I didn't know at the time. Um, one of one of my clients, I don't mind telling you who it was. His name was Michael Winslow. And he starred in all the police Academy movies. He was the man who made all the noises with his voice. Yes, I loved him. Yep. He was my client. And um, I didn't realize when we did Police Academy 1, well, I'll just tell you a quick little story of how we got there. I got Michael on to the gong show. That was the old Chuck Barris gong show. Yep, and we, we won that show. And woo, we got a trophy for a, a trophy and a check for $139. We were on our way, you know? So, but because of that show, um, Michael got a, a job offer to open for Count Basie in a concert. Did the opening for Count Basie at the end of that concert, a guy came backstage and he said he was a producer at Warner Brothers and was doing a movie and wanted to have Michael in it. And um, the guy's name was Paul Mislansky. And he ended up, he's the producer of Police Academy. He said, and by the way, they had that, that script was locked at that time. Locked in Hollywood means all the pre-writing, pre-production's done. They're ready to go before camera. They mm -hmm. unlocked the script and rewrote it to write Michael in. Mm -hmm. And so did, did the movie, but I didn't know what I didn't know as a manager because I had no idea about merchandising. And we signed a contract without merchandising included into it. And Michael's doll was the number one selling doll on that movie and made millions and we didn't get anything. Wow. So, but after the movie became a success and we went to police Academy two, I, tr then I knew about merchandising and I said, listen, we'd have a merchandising clause in here. And they said, no, it's too late. We're based. This is based on the first movie. And I said, okay, well then the price just doubled for Michael to do it. 
And they said, oh, we have favored nations. Everybody gets the same. I went, nope, I can play hardball too. So we got his price up. So, but you know, again, so I hated that part, the negotiating. Um, um, like I said, I did it for 18 years. See, I love to hate how long and what was the other one? And the learn, the learn. And I think that explaining how you didn't know what you didn't know, but once you figured it out, you knew how to negotiate a little bit better. Yeah. And that, that made me better at that as time went on too. Okay. Restaurant owner. Yes. Now, <laughs> owned it for two years. Mm -hmm. um, oh. What I loved about it was being able to have a constant party going on for my guests, which is the customers. Right. You know, every day was great. We had great entertainment. We had uh, a great crowd. It was a very successful restaurant. You know, being a stuntman, coming out of the stunt, I went right into that out of stunt work. I became a manager in a restaurant here almost at the same time, but um, I have a lot of celebrity friends. Mm -hmm. So, and they all lived, like, the restaurant was in Encino on Ventura Boulevard. And Encino is surrounded by like Tarzana. And that's where a lot of celebrities live, up in those hills right there. So, it was a very easy restaurant for them to come to visit. And once the public knows that celebrities are in a restaurant, the public starts to come. And we had valet parking. I mean, we were busy every night and it was just great. I loved it. What I hated about it, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It was a real job. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean, I loved it, but at the same time, business-wise, I mean, bartenders steal from you, cooks steal from you. I mean, it, I was told when I first opened the restaurant, they said, you know, take 15% off the top, right off the top for, for theft, because it's going to happen, wow. you know? And I, I, it was pretty accurate up to that, you know? And, and we do everything we can to prevent it. And, but people are people and, and you know, you, they're going to do what they're going to do. And yeah. um, so I hated that part of it, the, the, the work. And that's actually why I sold it. I, I just... After two years, I went, you know what? This is way, I don't have a life. This, yeah. this is my life. And I was a manager at the same time. And it was like, you know, and, and the reason I got to travel the world and I did that some, while I had the restaurant, I, I did some traveling. But when I finally sold the restaurant, I did a lot of traveling because Michael, the fact that he does the noises with his voice, mm -hmm. we can go anywhere in the world. And first of all, people know who he is and sounds translate, transcend any language. Right. You know, a lawnmower is a lawnmower. <laughs> yeah. He's so cool, like on that show, on that movie. I oh, to, yeah. He was my favorite part, you know, whenever he came on. So what, what would you say you learned from being in the restaurant business? That business is hard. Being in business is hard. Um, I love that you said that. It, it, especially the, the that not just the restaurant business but any retail business I, I think you know the marketing is hard I think it's a lot harder than people think mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of competition out there and and but it, you know it is hard but if you work at it you'll succeed at it you just got to work at it and be smart about it and understand too that you know get help ask for help help other people know stuff that you don't know you know back to the management thing i didn't know about that merchandising until somebody else told me about it that's a manager you know? right okay all right um roadie that's interesting to me well that's kind of like part of my traveling the world i was a roadie for michael oh okay because <laughs> yeah. i was treated i was treated a lot better than just a regular roadie not that roadies are treated bad i have a lot of friends that are roadies for, for musical acts but i didn't have to work quite as hard as most roadies have to work yeah taxi driver <laughs> that must have been interesting that was and that was again how life sometimes throws you curveballs and you've got to deal with it no matter what mm -hmm. um and this is kind of a sad story but and i don't want to get too much into the personal life of what michael because it's his business and i don't want to do oh, that but okay. let, let's just say that the rug got pulled out from underneath me unexpectedly okay. where all of a sudden all money stopped coming in 
And I had to figure out a way to continue my lifestyle, not just my lifestyle, but my family's, my wife and our house we lived in and be able to pay those bills. So I thought, what can I do for fast money? And I I happened to live in Orlando, Florida at this time. Mm -hmm. And I figured, man, there's a lot of taxi business going on for Disney World. And I said, I can do that. Actually, actually, I'll go back further. When I was in the army, Mm -hmm. way back when, I used to moonlight as a taxi driver in the army for extra money when I was on base. And that was at Fort Hood, Texas. And so- Hey, with that. (laughs) uh, What's that? I said, you were okay with doing it because you had the experience. I had the experience back then. Yeah. So then I figured, well, why not do it? Although I was like one of the very few pure English speaking drivers that Mm -hmm. are out there, but I did well. And so I was making money as a taxi driver. And I thought, this is cash money too. It's every day. And, uh, but you know, of course I knew all along that was, this was just a temporary, temporary fix. Although that temporary fix lasted almost a year. So what did you learn from that experience? I learned how to be humble, Mm -hmm. number one. Um, Again, I learned a lot about people because I had all types of people in the cab. Yeah. Um, I learned that um, it's okay to do whatever you have to do to make a living when you have to do it. And it's not bad. Mm -hmm. I also learned all the shortcuts around my city (laughs) so even today i can drive anywhere real quick (laughs) so this is the last one copywriter tell me what is a copywriter (laughs) a copywriter and i'm going to tell you a different story too right after this but a copywriter is somebody who does marketing materials and sells with the written word That could be a sales letter, that could be a billboard, that could be a commercial you watch on TV. All of those things are written by copywriters. Um, Any junk mail you receive at your house were written by a copywriter. So a copywriter is somebody that takes the elements that that can be persuasive to sell you something. Um, And and there's four things that make up copywriting. You have a headline and a headline's job is to get your attention. That's what all its job is. Your podcast, the Oh Hell No podcast, is a great headline. Mm -hmm. It gets people's attention. So in in the copywriting world, that's an A-plus you have going on right there. And I I didn't even know that. (laughs) Yep, see, but you did it naturally, and that's okay. Um, Then you have what they call the lead, and the lead is to create interest. So once you get somebody's attention with the headline, now you're going to get them interested in what you want to say next. Right. Once you have their interest, then you go into what they call the body of the copy. The body's job is to purely create desire to get people to want your product or your service. And then you have the call to action, simply telling them what to do. So th- that's copywriting. And I went to a copywriting school. Um, it was called AWAI out of Delray Beach, Florida. It's probably the best copywriting school in the world. Uh, some of the greatest copywriters have come out of there. Um, there was a copywriting school oh yeah oh yeah (laughs) copywriting is people who get into copywriting can write their own career for the rest of their life if they're good at it because everybody needs a copywriter every anybody that does any kind of sales page anybody that does any kind of advertising they need a copywriter a lot of people do it themselves and they might find they're not really successful at it and then they hire a talented copywriter and it could double quadruple uh, even 10x their business just because it's persuasive writing um and they can do it web websites they need copywriters to do a website to have a good headline a good lead for interest a good body to go on so copywriting was really uh then i said i'm gonna tell you two stories here because how everything in your, you do in life leads you to something else. Yep. One of the other things that I did after getting out of stunt work is I, I was a screenwriter. I was a staff screenwriter for Universal. And I learned about writing screenplays. And in writing screenplays, you deal with emotion. You know, you tell stories, but it's all designed to, to elicit some kind of emotion from the viewer. Well, copywriting is the same thing you want to elicit some kind of emotion from your reader. You know, we have what we call motivators, things that motivate people, you know, love motivates people. Everybody likes to be in love or fall in love or love something. And companies know that, so companies use it. If you go ever fly Southwest Airlines, you know that their logo on their planes is a heart. And 
also their stock symbol is L-U-V, love, uh, because they're using love as their motivator. McDonald's has the slogan, just loving it, you know? Um, so love's a, a big motivator. Fear is a huge motivator. Anything you can do to scare people into buying something, that's how alarm companies sell you the alarm for your house because you know they want to make sure that you heard about that home invasion that happened down the road. So you have to buy their security system. You know, um, curiosity, people are curious. So anything you can, you know, if I if I have a headline that says, What happened to all the honeybees? People are going to want to know what happened to all the honeybees. It's a it's a curiosity headline that they use in copywriting. So very similar to screenwriting is copywriting. So it, it came in, it fell right into place for me of what I was doing. And so I, I'd hire myself out as a copywriter to different companies. And I did very well at that. Still do well at that. I still get called on, on doing copyright now. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So um, right now you are a sales and marketing business trainer and a coach, right? Yep. yep. What do you love the most about marketing? Well, it's again, how I can affect people mm. knowing the psychology of people. And, and, and I just find it fascinating because we are so similar in so many ways, but we're also different, you know, give you an example of the differences. And I talk about this in my book, generationally, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a baby boomer. When I was raised, I was raised with different values uh, that were all happening in my generation. You know, my generation, we had the civil rights movement. We had the woman's movement. We had the Vietnam War, the most unpopular war of all time. Um, a lot was going on. We also had the peace, love and rock and roll happening in, in my generation. Um, the generation ahead of me was the, the traditional generation or the silent generation. And they were raised with different values. I mean, they were raised during the Great Depression. You know, so money was a whole different thing to them than it is to my generation and what they think of. They're a polite generation. You know, you talk to them, you got to say yes, sir, and, and no, ma'am, and please and thank you, because that's part of their communication style, where millennials are different. You know, the F-bomb, you can drop on them all day long, because that's part of their their you know, conversation. But now let's talk about millennials. Well, actually, before millennials, there's a generation after mine called Generation X. Now, they're also called latchkey kids. And they're called them latchkey kids because a lot of those kids, when they came home from school, nobody was home. Both mom and dad went to work. Mm. There you go. <laughs> you know what the good news is about that? Yeah. As a latchkey kid, you learned how to be independent. You learned how to, to fend for yourself. You know, you can deal with crisis. You know how to cook for yourself and clean for yourself. You know, so you're very independent. Um, and that was a good thing. So coming home, people thought, oh, you're, there's nobody home. Well, you're learning a lesson in a different way, you know. And then the millennials, millennials, I've raised three of them. Um, millennials, what I love about millennials is their values millennials don't care about your religion they don't care about the color of your skin they don't care about your sexual orientation they don't they love people all people and i think that one of the no matter what people think politically that that's not what i'm about to say it has nothing to do with politics well it does but it, nothing about how you feel about politics i just think that right now the baby boomers are handing over the power to millennials just like remember i said it was during I, when i grew up it was the civil rights movement you know, there was a lot of protesting going on, a lot of divisiveness in the country. But at that time, it was the traditional generation handing over the power to the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. So now it's the baby boomers handing over power to the millennials. This is good news for us as a people because millennials love all people. They're not like baby boomers who are prejudiced and who are greedy. And, you know, and I don't mean everybody's that way, but in just general you know, right. terms. Millennials aren't like that. Millennials are inclusive. And I think that once they do take over the power, uh, remember, you have to be 35 to run for president. The oldest millennial right now is 36. So we're starting to see it already, uh, especially with this election, but you're going to see it even more four years from now. But once they do get that power, I think that the world is a safer place because we're not going to be judging people the way that we do. We have been for the last 40 years, you know, so it's a good thing. Now there's one more generation and that is the one right behind millennials and that's generation Z. If you think about this, this is an interesting thought. Generation Z has never been on this planet without Amazon. They want things delivered to them. That's why you're seeing more and more uh, parking spaces, grocery stores for pickup. 
where they can order online and just pull up and have it delivered to you. Uh, Uber Eats, things like that. Those are all going to become very powerful businesses because Generation Z likes things delivered to them. They don't want to have to do it themselves. But that's the way they're being raised. That's the values. Yeah, they want everything fast. So yeah. what superpower do you think you have to have to be good at marketing, to do what you do? I believe that the, the superpower is to understand the psychology of people. I really do. Because, and it's not difficult stuff. Again, like I just said, if you know what generation they're from, you kind of know how to, to gear your talk to them to be able to communicate and build rapport. But you also have to understand communication styles. Again, not difficult, but if you don't think about it, then you don't know what you don't know. But communication styles, there's two major communication styles and you need to know these in your marketing. The person that you're talking to, do they want the details or do they just want the bullet points? Because that is a communication style that is inbred into us as people. I am one of those guys that I just like bullet points. Give me the Cliff's notes. I don't need the details. You know, if it's something, if you give me a, a bullet point that I find that's interesting, then I might want some more detail on it, but let me choose that. My wife, on the other hand, is the opposite. My wife loves details. You know, if I come home and I say, honey, how was your day? She tells me in detail. <laughs> You know, but I'm a bullet point guy. So in my mind, I'm going, please get to the point. <laughs> you sound like my husband. He says, I take too long to tell stories. Well, but. see, there you go. You're, you're a detail person. But but you know what? I, my wife and I've been married now for 27 years. So it's uh, it, it works out just fine for us. But but you have to know that um, I tell copywriters, or I tell businesses when you're doing marketing, you should write any of your sales copy or your or your website or whatever you're writing. You need to do it in bullets with a paragraph of detail explaining that bullet. If you'll do that, two things happen. Number one, you're reaching both the detail-oriented person and the, the person that likes the bullet points. Mm -hmm. But number two, that document or that website or that email looks readable. There's a lot of white space on it. It doesn't look like a solid block of text because that's what turns people off, especially nowadays. I mean, we're bombarded with all kinds of emails and sales copy and advertisement. We don't have time to read everything. I mean, do you read all your emails? Oh, God, I used to. I used to pride myself on that, but I've gotten so busy that it's really hard to. Now you have to have a filtering system, right? You got to look and see who it's from. Then you got to look at the subject line. I mean, we all, we all do that now. And if we understand that as business people, that our customer is going through the same thing that we go through, then we're going to be able to approach them better. In other words, let's join the conversation that's already in their head <laughs> because that's how you get there. Right. All right. So you have a new book, um, Rearranging Change how you market to an ever-changing world. So what made you write this book and what do you want readers to get from this book? Well, first of all, I named that book before COVID hit. I had no idea it was coming. But how, remember I told you the universe sometimes puts you in the right place at the right time. Yeah. It did hit, it was released in March of, of 2020, right when COVID hit. So because of the title, I think that helped it, but it ended up going to number one on Amazon in five different business categories, um, which I'm very thankful for. But the reason that I wrote it was because I was getting into coaching and, mm -hmm. and I thought, you know what, let me write a book and just kind of give everybody an idea of what it is I coach. And that's what it is. Now, uh, did you receive the copy I sent you? I don't know. If I, I sent you a hard copy in the mail. Oh, I don't know. I don't, I didn't, <laughs> that sounds crazy, right? I have to check my mailbox. <laughs> you can do that. But, but whenever you do, what you're going to notice about that book is that I put a lot of what I learned as a screenwriter into the book because I learned you've got to entertain people to keep them wanting to read. And my book is very entertaining. Good. But I can't wait to go check my mailbox. There you go. But just like, just like, you know, you said you were generation X, just yeah. like coming home without your parents there. And we called you latchkey kids. Mm -hmm. Well, you didn't realize what you were learning at the time, but the lessons you actually learned are going to be with you for the rest of your life. And that's the independence. My book is like that. My book, you're just having fun reading it 
but you don't realize you're actually learning something until you go, oh yeah, I, I re that's what he said. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, yeah. it just, it works out that way. And I just, so I wrote it because that's what I coach now and, and I wanted people to see it. So you know, it's worked out nicely. By the way, I've written four books in my lifetime. Yeah, see. None of them on the same <laughs> subject. He is not a new author, people. Don't you know. <laughs> but, but Rearranging Change is actually the one that did the best commercially. But uh, yeah, I wrote a book on, on, on uh, my first book I ever wrote. I actually wrote it for the birthday gag gift market. It was mm -hmm. called The Denture Wearer's Cookbook, uh, Fulls, Partials, and Flippers. And it's humorous. But, you know, a lot of people wear dentures. So I, I have real recipes in there and I have it categorized by easy, intermediate and advanced chewing. <laughs> so there's cartoons in it. And it was, it's just a fun book. Uh, and I wrote a book on the business of acting to show actors how to, if they want to really get into acting, understand the business side of acting. There's a lot to know there, you know, agents and managers and headshots and, you know, really what is the business side of this and what you're getting into. And then I wrote a book on uh, the after school pickup business for martial arts schools on how to pick up kids from schools and the best way to uh, best program. Uh, we didn't even touch on that. Another job that I had in martial arts schools. I had three of them. <laughs> well, you had a lot of jobs. I couldn't touch on everything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But you know, like I said, they all they all led me to where I am today. Yeah, they all led me to where I am today. One of the things about martial arts that I learned in the business of martial arts was understand who your customer is. A lot of martial arts schools think that their customer are those sixth and seventh graders because that's their biggest population in their classes. Yeah, that's not their customer. Their customer are those kids' parents. Right. It's who's writing the check is the customer. So I used to watch uh, other martial arts school owners when they, they do like they call intro lessons where they bring a kid in and they give them a free lesson mm -hmm. where the parent would come in with the kid. The parent would go sit on a bench and the kid would get on the mat and he'd punch and he'd kick. And then when they were done, they would take the parent into the office and try to sell them on a program. Yep. And a particular friend of mine did this. And I said to him, this, I was coaching back then. I said to him, I said, well, you know, the interesting thing is you did the whole lesson with that kid and then you asked the parent to give you money. I said, next time, why don't you do this? Next time, bring the child onto the mat and then go over to the parent and say, excuse me, can you take your shoes off, please? You're going to come over and help us. Have them bow in just like you had the child. I said, then have them hold the, the pad for the child to punch and kick. They're going to be looking in that child's eyes. They're going to see the joy that a child's having in this lesson. Then take them in the office and try to sell them. <laughs> He quadrupled his business because now you're involving the person with the check, the pay, you know, that pays the money. So you got to involvement leads to commitment. So make sure you're involving your customer. <laughs> wow, Steve, you are tricky. <laughs> yeah. Hey, <laughs> I love it. So what is the best advice you have ever received? And what's the worst advice you've ever received? The best advice I've ever received. Um, I didn't receive it directly, but I did receive it indirectly. And that was a lyric from John Lennon. And it said, uh, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. Mm. So when things don't go my way, or sometimes when they do go my way, I have to remember that life is what happens to me when I'm busy making other plans. And it's all okay. And it's all good. And what's the worst advice? The worst advice is, hmm, I can always find a silver lining in everything, but I would say the worst advice is to get, somebody told me one time in the management business, get every dime you can hmm. out of people. And I just don't, I, I just never, I've never bought that. When you make money more important than, than relationships, it's, it's a problem. That's why I said, you asked me about what I hated the most about management was the negotiation part of it. Because, you know, I understand greed and I understand that, that if you're going to play in that field, you got to play by those rules. And, but it's not something I've ever been comfortable with. And I still am not even, you know, I, I charge to coach people, but I, I think I charge a reasonable fee, you know, for what they get in return, because I'm giving them results. And if the results are paying them back more than they're paying me, we're all winners here. And, and so I just didn't like that advice to try to, you know, be cutthroat and be dog eat dog and get as much as I can. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah. So do you feel like you're doing purpose-driven work? 
And if you do feel like you are, what do you think specifically is the work that's, you know, um, fulfilling your soul? Yes, I do feel like I'm doing purposeful work. Um, and I believe that, that, and I've done this my whole life and no matter what job I've ever had, mm -hmm. I'm in service to other people. Mm, okay. And I believe that if you can be of service to other people, you're going to succeed. Zig Ziglar said that if you help enough other people, if you help enough people get everything they want out of their life, you will get everything you want out of your life. But it starts with you helping them. And as a taxi driver, I help people get around driving them. As a restaurant owner, I help feed people. As a, a stuntman, I helped entertain people. You know, even as a writer, a screenwriter, I was entertaining people with, with words, you know, so I can't think of any job I've ever done where I wasn't in service to somebody. And so I think that's very purposeful. Um, hopefully, I mean, one of the best jobs, I don't even want to call it a job that I've ever had in my life is that as a father, you know, with my kids and, you know, doing the best to try to, to instill in them that being human first is the most important thing they can do and understand be in service to other people, you know, even, and they are, all my daughters are in service to other people in their own way. You know, I've got a daughter that's a Lieutenant in the Navy now, you know, right. it's, it's in, in, she's in service to the country. I mean, she's, right. but so just, you know, and that's fulfilling. I mean, talk about, you know, I mean, I could cry when I think about my family because I love them so much. And it's, it's just, you know, it's been a, a glorious part of my life, you know. Love so that, Steve. That's amazing. So on the Oh Hell No podcast, I always ask my guests to share an Oh Hell No moment that has taught them something or changed their perspective on something. So please share an Oh Hell No moment with us. Um, oh, hell, uh, oh Hell No moments are moments of shock or disbelief where you might pause and, you know, maybe to yourself say, oh, hell no, what do I do now? Or, oh my God, how did this happen? Could be good, could be bad, but it <laughs> just changes something in your life. <laughs> well, I tell you, I, I, I had an oh hell no moment last Wednesday when the Capitol was overrun. I mean- I know, that was a big oh hell no moment. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and part of it wasn't, just watching it happen. But part of it was like, wait a minute, I don't ever want to live in a time where there's turmoil like this, because, you know, you, you heard about it throughout history, whether it was the Roman Empire, or Germany, or the, this kind of turmoil is serious stuff. And it's like, oh, come on, I've almost made it through without this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> even, even, you know, other movements that happened weren't like this. This is like, our country is really on the verge of a civil war. And it's like, whoa. So that's, oh, hell no. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Guys, you know, what's wrong with you people? It, it, <laughs> I know, it's crazy. So um, other than that, um, hmm, that's a really good question. Yeah. It's a really good think question. That, think of something that you learned something from, or it, it was a moment where something maybe, maybe it was that moment where you um started doing taxi driving. I don't well, know. that's that 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 was my most humbling moment. Right. You know, and and um and it's interesting to think about because you know, my reputation. And my, my friends, the circle that you're always in, and you're, it's like, when I started doing that, it was like, well, what do I say to them? Right. And then I thought, tell them the truth. Right. You know, it's like, for, but for a moment there, it was like, oh, what mask do I need to put on here to explain this away? And then I thought, I'm not going to wear a mask. I'm not going to explain it away. It is what it is, you know, and it's okay. It's yeah. okay. Um, I, I've been disappointed in my life. I've, I've, I've. I've seen where loyalty is not reciprocated mm -hmm. and that it, that's sad, but I also learned forgiveness is a very powerful thing. Yeah. And I have forgiveness in my heart. And so I can be happy, you know, okay. although right. I must say, allegedly, I must <laughs> say in this a particular case where I did forgive, uh -huh. I had some satisfaction finding out that karma paid a, price on them oh good <laughs> <laughs> all right all right you so tell everyone how we can keep up with you connect with you mm -hmm. website. yeah there's a couple things you can do um 
my website is stevemcchesney.com. And by the way, McChesney is spelled just like Kenny Chesney. Just put an MC in front of it. Now you know how to spell it. Um, so stevemcchesney.com is my website. Uh, if my book, Rearranging Change, anybody that's in marketing should have a copy of this book. I, I think you're going to find that it's very helpful. Uh, if you want a hard copy, you can actually have in your hands and read. You can go to Amazon. It's just called Rearranging Change, How You Market to an Ever-Changing World. If you'd like to get a PDF copy where you can read it on the computer, I'll give you a free copy of that. Just go to rearrangingchange.com. So rearrangingchange.com, you get a free PDF. If you'd actually like to have that book in your hand, you're going to have to go to Amazon and uh, get it from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. It was great having you on the show. I really appreciate it. And Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.